Welcome to the Church of Perpetual Life, everyone. My name is Neil Vandry, and I am your officiator. I'd also like to welcome everyone that is joining us online and uh, doing the live streaming. In past services, we've had over 60 people join us through the live stream, watching the service. And we're helping people and assisting people to create meetups all around the world, all around the country, where they're doing watch parties of our events. So welcome everyone who's online watching tonight. And here at the Church of Perpetual Life, we refer to ourselves as immortalists, not because we have defeated death yet, but because we have faith in that future technology will conquer the disease of aging as well as death itself. While we fully understand and recognize that this technology does not appear to be currently available, the impressive history of human problem solving and technological advancements Give us faith in this inevitability. As you know, the RADFest was just a couple of weeks ago. Many of our members, both local here and those who are online and around the world, came to the RADFest to watch the presentations by people like Ray Kurzweil and Jim Mellon, Dr. Neil Reardon and Terry Grossman, Suzanne Summers, Arbor de Grey, and our own Bill Falloon gave presentations there, as well as many others. Nearly a thousand people came from all over the globe to celebrate life and unlimited lifespans. The presentations at the RADFest were recorded, and you can get a copy of these recordings. If you're interested in doing that, you can go to the RADFest website or contact me, and I'll get you in touch with the place to go to get those recordings. You can buy one, or you can buy the entire conference. It was a fantastic conference. I hope you'll be able to join us next year. If you didn't come this time, I hope you'll be able to join us next year at the RADFest. Our mission here at Perpetual Life is to assist all people in radical life extension, healthy human life for a long, long time. And we provide fellowship here at our regular services. We generally have a service once a month. And we have guest speakers that teach scientific rationality along with the Creator's plan that humanity evolved to achieve markedly extended healthy lifespans. We follow the prophet's Arthur C. Clarke who said, the limits of the possible can only be, def be defined by going beyond them into the impossible. And the prophet Nikolai Fedorov's philosophy of the common task for humanity. Fedorov believed, as we do here, that we should divert human energies away from wars and dissension toward measures for protecting mankind against natural disasters, such as floods and droughts, earthquakes, hurricanes, and especially aging, and to transform nature from a temporary enemy into an eternal friend. I'd like to, at this point, bring up my assistant, who's got a few words to say on longevity. Let's give a hand to Deborah Horton. Deborah, come on up. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> OK. I really appreciate Neil giving me the opportunity to offer the following that I consider to be an integral part of the puzzle pertaining to longevity and age reversal. Although no doubt anything that the greatly respected Bill Falloon has to say on the subject is precious information as his expertise is unlimited. However, aside from all things connected to the medicinal aspects of attaining the goal of living longer and better, we also must consider all the psychological ramifications that contribute to a healthier and longer life. The implementation of techniques to balance our emotions is crucial to staying healthy and living longer. And one such technique is the ancient art of meditation. In fact, the beneficial outcomes of doing vipassana also known as mindfulness meditation, is being studied by neuroscientists conducting a plethora of scientific tests on long-time meditators. They have conclusively found that those individuals who have meditated 12,000 hours or more and counting reacted overall, a lot calmer and more even keeled to stressful stimuli than those who have never meditated. What's more, scientists are also at the beginning stages of discovering that through scientific research, that meditation over time has the ability to slow down the shortening process 
of those parts of our chromosomes that control aging known as telomeres, thereby affording us the control over how fast we allow ourselves to age. Another important, very important fact and factor in reaching and maintaining optimum health is how do we achieve to perceive a more positive view of life? Your situational outlook is more important than you think when it comes to assisting your biological cells in slowing down the aging process. Moreover, if your intrinsic tendency is to perceive things in a negative fashion, then find any one of the countless holistic methods that can put you squarely on the road from being a pessimist to becoming an optimist. After all, your life depends on it. In summation, I'd like to quote a most befitting passage from the English poet William Blake's novel, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chunks of his cavern. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. All right. Once again, this church, the Church of Perpetual Life, is a science-based church, a transhumanist church. Our faith is in humanity to find ways towards a healthy, unlimited lifespans. And we have meetings typically once a month throughout the year. Next month, November the 8th, we invite you all back, November the 8th, Kelsey Moody from i Therapeutics will be here, as well as Bill Falloon again to give another update on age reversal. As usual, our doors in November will open at 6 o'clock. I'd like to remind you that we have a lending library. It's grown. It's double in size. Feel free to check out a book tonight. Bring it back next month. It's, you'll see it right here outside these doors. Also outside these doors, you'll find the cryonics table. If you have an interest, if you're curious about cryonics, you can get some information there and learn a little bit about it. You can also talk to me or others here about that if you have interest. We're very happy to receive your donations on books. If you have any books regarding unlimited lifespans, health, and cryonics, we're very happy to receive your books at the, for the library. The reason it's in double in size is one of our members has donated half of their library, so we've got all those books. Spain will be hosting the next Global Futurist Summit during the October 19th, 20th, and 21st. Humanity Plus will be the main international organizer of this World Congress, Transvision 2018, with the help of leading associations and organizations working on futuristic concepts like longevity extension, artificial intelligence, human enhancement, and other technologies. If you want to go to Transvision 18 in Spain, let me know. I'll get you more information on that. Our speaker tonight, you know very well, since 1980, Bill Falloon has been uncovering and pioneering approaches for preventing and treating, treating the disease of aging. These avant-garde advances were meticulously chronicled in one of his many publications years before conventional doctors recognized them, and Bill Falloon has been featured in hundreds of media appearances, including the Phil Donahue Show, the Joan Rivers Show, Tony Brown's Journal, ABC News Day One, and Newsweek Magazine. A review of what Bill Falloon and his organizations have accomplished over the past 38 years revealed just how badly conventional medicine lags behind life-saving scientific advances. Bill Falloon has authored books exposing the atrocities committed against the American public by FDA bureaucrats, including his books, Pharmocracy and Pharmocracy Two. We have both of those in our library if you'd like to read them. And they reveal how corrupt deals and misguided medical regulations are bankrupting America and what can be done to resolve it. Based on published findings in animal models and preliminary findings in people, there may already exist methods to systematically reverse biological aging, and Bill is always on the cutting edge of research. His companies have contributed millions of dollars worth uh, towards age reversal research. Tonight, Mr. Falloon will be giving us an update on age reversal. Please help me welcome a man who has always been ahead of conventional medicine, our founder, Mr. Bill Falloon.
Thank you for the kind words, Neil. I think a lot of people here have known me for a number of decades. For those who, who don't know me, I've dedicated the past 41 years to identifying technologies aimed at enabling people to live longer in good health with no upper longevity limit. For the first time in my history, or the history of medical science for that matter, I'm able to cite a peer-reviewed study that was published earlier this year showing that Americans are slowing their rate of aging. And what we've been preaching for the last 40 plus years that aging is something that's controllable has now been validated in a very large epidemiological study. It's showing that Americans as a group are slowing down the clock of aging. They are not suffering the pathological consequences that our fathers and grandparents had to deal with. We're slowing it down so much that just over a very brief period of time, from 1988 to 2010, men have decreased their biological age over four years, women over three years. And what should impress this congregation more than anything else is that the degree of age delay, the decrease in aging, has a lot to do with modifiable health behaviors. And guess what? That's what virtually every one of you in this congregation is involved with every single day. You watch what you eat. You get some physical activity in. You're involved in some of the more aggressive approaches using the drug metformin. You're taking care of your health and you're getting a big reward. You are decreasing your biological age. Bear in mind, this data reflects a sampling of the entire American population. It includes people who do not take care of themselves. But even these individuals are benefiting from technological advances. They're getting on medications that is decreasing their rate of aging due to type 2 diabetes, due to hyperlipidemia. They are doing a whole lot to benefit. And what they looked at in this study are blood tests that you all have done on a consistent basis. Lipids, glucose, C-reactive protein as it relates to inflammation, uh, breathing capacity, bone marrow function, and these are the measurements that they used to validate that we, as an entire population, are slowing our rate of biological aging. This is the first study ever amongst an entire sampling of Americans showing that there is a delayed rate of aging. Fantastic news for us. We've been talking about it for over 40 years, and it's finally happened. But what does that translate into? Well, heart failure, huge cause of people dying. And starting in 1995, going up to 2014, that's only 19 years, he had a 44% reduction in sudden death rates amongst heart failure patients. Now, a lot of that has to do with what conventional medicine has done and also alternative medicine. The combination of the two has resulted in a large decrease in a leading cause of age-related death. Uh, dementia, everyone talks about in the media that there's nothing we can do about Alzheimer's, there's gonna be an epidemic of it, and there's no way to slow it down or reverse it. They're all wrong by, uh, about that, by the way. But the great news is there are four independent published studies that reveal that people who take care of themselves are not becoming demented the way that typical people are who abuse their bodies throughout their life. These four independent studies show that the prevalence of dementia is sharply decreasing. That doesn't mean there isn't more people with Alzheimer's because there's more elderly people, but the actual prevalence of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia is plummeting dramatically. And it's plummeting because, well, we're taking better care of ourselves. And that includes guarding against heart attacks. When we reduce our risk of heart attack, we reduce our risk of ischemic stroke, and we reduce our risk of Alzheimer's disease. In other words, what we are doing to protect our cardiovascular systems is translating into marked reductions in dementia incidences. These are four independent studies that I showed you in that previous slide. Four independent studies confirming that the prevalence of dementia is decreasing, and what we do has a lot to do with it. And these these are some of the overlooked risk reductions for uh, losing our mind. The, the, the dementia, it can be caused by people not replacing their hormones, by eating poorly. And people at this church, we're watching what we eat. We're taking care of ourselves in ways that we're protecting our neurons the way we are our cardiocytes. Now, I, I put this slide up about a year ago 
showing that a study done in the Journal of American Medical Association, published in 2017, uh, showed that between 1980 and 2014, the number one cause of death, heart attack, declined by 50%. That's a 34-year period of time. It's trivial when you look at how long mankind has been around, but over that 34-year period, a 50% decline in the number one cause of degenerative illness and death. Well, some researchers at the University of Washington wanted to depict this on a map. And this is a 15-second video I'm going to play for you. This map shows baseline, 1980, lots of heart attacks, lots of strokes, number one cause of people dropping dead. And the blue areas show parts of the country where there are reduced numbers of heart attacks and strokes, and the yellow and orange are showing areas of the country where there's more prevalent uh, people dying, more prevalence of heart disease. So what I'm going to do is play this for you right now, and what you're going to see over a 34-year period is the entire country converting more to the blue and dark blue color. This represents a progressive decrease in death rates from heart attacks. This is really magnificent that over 34 years we've been able to accomplish this much with the most common killer of aged people. I'm going to show this one more time. Again, this is baseline. 1980, lots of heart attacks, lots of strokes. No one really thought that it was going to go away, and yet technology emerged. People started taking care of themselves, and over the 34-year period of time, the country slowly starts to turn blue. And you can see the whole country, even in areas where people don't take as good of care of themselves as they should, the heart attack death rate declined. Now, the media, they're picking up on lots and lots of laboratory research where they're seeing the animals are reversing aging or living longer in response to interventions. Some incredible news released this year. FDA has approved the Mayo Clinic to produce billions of stem cells and use them in clinical trials to see if they cannot reverse biological aging in people or cure or alleviate chronic disease. These are really major breakthroughs. American Association of Retired Persons, April 2018. Their magazine reads like an alternative health journal. They're talking about the science of enabling people to live longer and healthier and advocating that their members maybe plan for a lot more opportunities in the future because they're not going to die on schedule. And National Geographic, they talked about our prophet of this church, Nikolai Fedorov, talking about physical immortality, people living for indefinite period of time. We've got the mainstream media picking up on what started in this church in 2013 and what started with my various groups back in the 1970s. That is advocating for the science to advance so that we all live long and outrageously healthy lives. Now, Popular Science did an investigative report. They were at this church. They interviewed me in many locations. They interviewed research scientists, and they did a fantastic article about the prospect of aging being a reversible condition. They interviewed scientists at Harvard, Mayo, Scripps. They went all over the country interviewing these scientists who all said, yeah, we're reversing aging in animals, and we think we'll start doing it in people soon. Now, the scientists didn't believe in immortality yet. They didn't believe quite that would happen, and that's okay. So they portrayed me as the forever man, and I was featured in the article more than anybody else because when the scientists said my technology isn't going to enable people to live forever, I rebutted, well, it's going to enable us to get to an era when people will live very long, productive lives. And George Church, his research continues to indicate that if we can just live long enough, we may have a legitimate cure for biological aging that renders all, everything else we're doing perhaps op obsolete. If we can edit our genes in such a way that we put them back into a youthful state, we could theoretically achieve biological immortality. George Church has that objective. He plans to start using his CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology on 12-year-old dogs. And if it works on dogs, he plans to be one of the first people to self-experiment with this CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. He's getting a lot of favorable coverage by a lot of prestigious media sources. They think he may hold the key to people 
finding a way to eradicate biological aging. He's a Harvard professor. He's got a good source of funding, by the way. That's really good news. He's got money, he's got credentials, and he's got technology that may enable people to live for a long time. Now, you've probably read in a lot of different places that the billionaires in Silicon Valley are putting money into age reversal research. And this is an absolute fact. These young people who have made billions of dollars doing the impossible, they are putting big money into research. The problem is it may not occur fast enough. They're younger than us. They don't have the sense of urgency that we do. The Google founders, well, they are determined to find a solution to make aging a manageable condition. They set up a company called Calico uh, uh, five years ago. Actually, the, the, around the same time this church was founded, the Google founders set up a research entity to try to uncover ways to slow down or reverse biological aging. Now, the breakthrough news is they've made a huge commitment with a big pharma company to develop anti-aging drugs. They're putting over $1 billion into this project to discover drugs to enable people to age better or maybe not age at all. Now, the problem with Calico and Google is, well, their age is around 35, 38 years of age on average. They don't have the sense of urgency that I do or that most people in this room do. We need to accelerate these technologies faster because I hate to say it, nine years from now, some of us won't be here if we don't intervene into our aging process. And what happened the week of RADFest, literally the week of RADFest, September 17th, 2018, we're talking just a couple weeks ago, the Journal of the American Medical Association published three viewpoint articles about slowing and reversing biological aging. I didn't think this would happen for another five to eight years. But they picked up on the science. The science is irrefutable that when you give older animals certain medications, those animals have their rate of aging slowed. They have their risk of disease reduced. And in some cases, those old animals grow biologically younger. So JAMA published uh, information, uh, these viewpoint articles by leading scientists talking about people living a real long time. And this was the most pessimistic of those three articles, by the way. This is a Dr. Olshansky. He's a, a research scientist. He does believe that we're going to improve our health span. He's rather pessimistic about how long, though, that will make it. He, he's looking for people to live to be 90 to 100 in good health. And I'm looking for people to live 90 to 100 in good health and then go on to two or 300 after that. But nonetheless, he, he, he's uh, talking about the fact that we should celebrate and recognize the achievement of life extension that has occurred from 1900 to today because it's truly been remarkable. In 1900, the average person lived to be 47 years of age. And half of that 47 years was spent typically in a state of chronic pain. Just imagine uh, heartburn, esophageal reflux. Well, there were no antacids or proton pump inhibitors to temporarily take care of that. Uh, injuries that were not able to be repaired. Infectious diseases, um, that 47 years it lived to, uh, on average, in year 1900, they weren't all good years. And yet, we've been able to accelerate our lifespans by using technology to intervene. This was one of the more favorable articles. Talked about rapamycin and metformin combined perhaps adding 20 more years to the healthy human lifespan. Now, this has never been published in the Journal of American Medical Association. They are a conservative group. They wait for hardcore evidence to manifest before they usually publish an article. And yet, in the September 17th issue of JAMA, they're talking about people extending their lifespans by 20 years, utilizing technologies that you've heard about in this church. You heard about it the first talk I gave, about the need for us all to consider metformin. And we've also talked about rapamycin. And there's many other interventions I'm going to talk about during this talk. Now, this is what I presented at, at RADFest as a stair-step approach to us, everyone in this room, reaching year 2030. That is when rather pessimistic uh, projections are the CRISPR-Cas9 will be perfected and then aging itself will become a manageable condition. If we manage it right, we'll never have a problem. And so what we put there as step number one is rapamycin, 
followed up by NAD replacement, senolytic therapy, um, young plasma. And if we do all that, we make it to the year 2030. CRISPR-Cas9 edits our genes back down to a youthful profile. We're young forever, at least biologically. That's a fantastic, fantastic projection, and yet it's realistic. Now, we've altered that a little bit since RADFest. We're thinking at this point that if you're on metformin, if you're intermittent fasting, if you're calorie restricting, if you're boosting your AMPK through different means, you may not need to start with the rapamycin. You might want to start with the NAD replenishment, which I'm going to talk about. And as it relates to immortality, as you know, popular science referred to me as the immortal man. Well. If we are able to live to 2030, aging becomes manageable. We then knock off the diseases that are still out there killing us. We then look at protecting ourselves against accidents. We want to make sure we make it into the singularity when our neocortex will merge with the cloud. And at that point, through the transhumanist theory, we will achieve total immortality. Whether we want to retain our biological bodies or not, that will be an option. Now, the technologies that we're going to recommend represent nothing more than tourniquets compared to what's going to happen in 2030 and 2050. But guess what? You leave this church tonight, get involved in an accident, and you're hemorrhaging and you're going to bleed to death on the scene, and someone takes their belt off and wraps it around your leg and stops the bleeding, that's a tourniquet, gets you to an ER room where they can save your life. And you walk out of that hospital in a couple days as opposed to going to the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office and being autopsied and being dead forever. So tourniquets do have a role in being able to enable difficult challenges to be overcome. Our challenge is putting the pieces together. We know of multiple interventions that we think can slow down or reverse aging. And most of these are available right now. We want to put them together in a sequential order. So our age reversal battle strategy is to investigate what may be out there, validate it in people who are utilizing it, and then disseminate the information to you so that you know what's working, what's not working, and how well some of these age reversal interventions are working. So it's critical that before you engage in any meaningful age reversal intervention, you get a lot of blood tests done so that we see where you are. And I can tell you a real sad story. Somebody spent a lot of money. They went down to Panama for some aggressive stem cell replacement therapy, and they came back. And they then emailed me with their blood test results saying, I'm not sure if I've improved. I said, well, where are your baseline? Oh, I didn't do a baseline. The person spent over $21,000. Does not know if he benefited or not because he didn't do a baseline blood test. So if you are going to engage in some of these aggressive interventions, you've got to get some at least basic blood tests done. We advocate a much more elaborate set so that we know as an individual, are you slowing or reversing your aging process? And then we can share that with the group. So an age management panel uh, should consist of as many different tests as you can afford, frankly. Uh, this is what we're recommending for people who are undergoing NAD replacement and some of the other therapies that I'm going to talk about. You get as many blood tests done as you can as a baseline, and then once you're done with the different therapies, have that same test redone to see if it really worked. If we don't do this, we're going to be talking 10 or 20 years from now wondering what is effective and what is not. And some of the components of this blood Test panel that we suggest involves thrombotic risk. Over the age of 50, an abnormal clot forming in an artery or a vein, leading cause of death, thrombosis over age 50. So we want to see what your thrombotic risk factors are ahead of time. If you are at risk, we'll get those taken care of ahead of time. We hate to see people experiment with an age reversal intervention and then throw a stroke or a heart attack because they didn't have their thrombotic risk factors measured. We want to know what your inflammatory status is. If it's too high, try to su suppress it before you undergo the age reversal intervention. Just imagine you're putting in fresh young stem cells and your body literally is on fire due to chronic inflammation. Well, those stem cells they're going to be destroyed. So if you can lower your inflammatory burden, it's more likely that the age reversal intervention is going to be more effective. And we're going to look at hormones. If you are not balancing your hormones and you're going to undergo an age reversal intervention, you reduce the probability of it working for you because your hormones are enabling your cells to talk to each other. And if you're out of hormone balance, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And as it relates to 
growth factors? Well, we want to know where you are right now at baseline. Uh, when your growth factors are too low, your organs atrophy. You suffer sarcopenia. Your brain shrivels, literally. But when the growth factors are too high, your risk of cancer and premature death, they are unfortunately increased. So there's a sweet spot, and we want to make sure you hit that sweet spot as it relates to insulin and IGF-1 with your age reversal program. We want to make sure that all happens. And of course, glycemic markers. Most of us have fasting insulin and sugar, blood glucose, and hemoglobin A1C. It's typically above what you want to be. I don't think people in this group are in that category, by the way. The typical American has fasting glucose way too high. And lipids, as it relates to cholesterol, triglycerides, important, but we're also looking at apolipoprotein B and small, dense LDL particles. We want you to do this again before you undergo the age reversal intervention so that you don't have a heart attack while you're undergoing therapy and perhaps blame it on the therapy. If you have high LDL, we'll lower it. It's not that hard to do. And a lot of these other issues can be corrected. Now, immune senescence, that's a little bit more challenging to reverse. But again, part of the age management blood test panel that we're suggesting is that you get the baseline for your immune markers, and then we can evaluate you afterwards to see if the intervention reversed immune senescence. We've had Dr. Maharaj talk at this church several times and others about the fact that if nothing else kills us, a defective immune system will. A defective immune system emits pro-inflammatory signals and at the same time fails to eradicate bacteria, viruses, and pre-malignant cells. We need to restore healthy immune function. And of course, we want to know what your kidney and liver function indicators are because some people are going to present with some early signs of renal failure. Over age 60, a lot of people, they have kidney impairment. We're hoping some of these interventions will help reverse that. So these are some of the, uh, let's see, I'll go back there, the cost of this outrageously expensive, uh, outrageously expensive, um, the, the group that we've put together, we've been able to get the price down to 695, but what I tell everybody is, if you've got good health insurance and you're seeing a doctor, he may be able to prescribe all these tests, and then it might be nothing. You may be able to get these tests done at no charge whatsoever. So we did get the cost down, but we also want to encourage people to try to get it done uh, through the doctor at maybe low or no cost. So again, tragedy of lost data. If you fail to do a baseline blood test and you undergo some aggressive age reversal interventions, wow, have we lost data forever. We'll never be able to recapture where you were in the beginning. We'll know where you were afterwards, but we won't know where you were in the beginning. And again, going back to JAMA, this deals with the a process of age reversal known as synolytics. Synolytic therapy, they selectively remove senescent cells from your body. As we grow older, we have certain cells that we would wish would just die. They linger, they emit chronic inflammatory signals, they do all kinds of damage, including secreting protein degrading enzymes that literally eat away at our healthy cells. We need to purge our body of these dysfunctional senescent cells that really circumvent, circumvent the ability of the regenerative therapies to have their full effect. And to give you an example uh, of what these senescent cells are like, uh, just imagine you have an uncle that you were maybe not particularly close to, but he only had two weeks to live, and he begged, can you please not let me die in an institution? Will you please let me die at home around some family members? So you think, okay, two weeks, we will put ourselves out. We'll bring that sick uncle in there. He's vomiting, he's moaning, he's emitting all kinds of terrible odors, but we're going to put up with it for two weeks. That sick uncle stays in your living room for two weeks, and then it goes for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Your life life is turned upside down. You really just want that individual to do what he's supposed to do. Instead, he lingers. And that's what's happening in your body with these accumulated senescent cells. They're spewing out pro-inflammatory cytokines. They're emitting these protein-degrading enzymes. It, they are killing you, literally. So getting rid of them is essential. Now, this study was published 2015. They took two compounds, a prescription drug called dacitinib and a dietary supplement that you can buy anywhere called quercetin, and they gave them to old animals. Those rodents had a systemic reversal of their aging process merely by removing 
these senescent cells. That's all they had to do to derive all of those benefits. It really shows you how deadly and toxic these senescent cells are in our body. We need to get them out of our body, and CNN has been recognizing it with some media reports that it's time to start taking this animal research and trying it out on people, and even the federal government putting money into senolytic research. They want to see what happens when older people have their uh, senescent cells eliminated, how much health span can be restored. This could spare Medicare from insolvency. Now, the popular press is picking up on the senescent cells by referring to them as zombie cells. And it's a very accurate depiction because just one senescent cell in a group of healthy cells in a tissue by emitting these metalloproteinases, these are these protein degrading enzymes, well they're killing your healthy cells. They're like reaching out and biting the healthy cell and then spewing out inflammatory factors. You need to purge your body of these senescent cells if we are going to achieve our objective of living to 2030 when CRISPR-Cas9 will solve the whole problem for us. We don't have to worry about taking dacetin, and quercetin, and all the other interventions. But right now, we're dealing with tourniquets, and we've got some really good tourniquets available to us. And again, the media is picking up on the fact that we need to do something about the senescent cell burden that anyone over the age of 30 or 40 is carrying with them, and it is shortening their healthy lifespan. This is a, a pioneer with the uh, trial on metformin, where he is hoping to be able to show that metformin really does delay aging and improve health spans and he's also advocating well maybe before metformin we need to get rid of these senescent cells because whatever benefit metformin derives the senescent cells get in the way and it's not just acetin and quercetin peptides and a number of different compounds are being developed to purge our body of senescent cells and when that happens they're seeing old animals grow biologically younger including improvements in their kidney function which is a real good measure of aging because unfortunately a lot of us uh, suffer kidney failure before everything else goes. Now, Unity has raised some big money to study senolytic drugs. This is spectacular, but they're not even starting their clinical trial yet. It's months away, and then it needs to go through the clinical trial process, the FDA approval process. We don't have that kind of, kind of time to wait. So we're advocating that people engage in a senolytic protocol right now remove your senescent cells before they kill you. And a study coming come out in July, it emphasized more than anything else how deadly these senescent cells are. They looked at uh, younger mice who had senescent cells transplanted in their bodies, and it resulted in accelerated degenerative aging. And those senescent cells planted into young healthy mice, they spread rapidly throughout their bodies. And this is happening to our bodies right now if we don't get these senescent cells out. And when they implanted senescent cells into older mice, wow, what a horrible effect. The mice suffered the same kind of physical decline and they died sooner. Now, if we were talking 10 years ago or even five years ago, we'd be looking at this data saying, wow, we cannot do anything about the fact we harbor senescent cells. We're just gonna have to live with them as long as we can and drop dead. Great news, great news. The same study where they transplanted senescent cells into old mice, they then gave them dacetinib and coercetin. And what they were able to find is spectacular results. These are both normally aged mice with lots of senescent cells and aged mice with more of them injected, but by the dacetinib and quercetin being administered, they were able to alleviate the physical dysfunction and improve post-treatment survival by 36%. Wow, 36% longevity enhancements by using senolytic therapies. Time Magazine picked up on this right after the study was published. And they made it very clear that if there's just one senescent cell amongst a group of seven to 15,000 healthy cells, that one senescent cell initiates physical decline. That's all it takes.
This is how toxic these cells are and why we need to remove them from our body. And then the LA Times did a more extensive article and brought out interesting tidbits from the study. And that is these old mice that were loaded with senescent cells normally, well, they were the human equivalent of 75 to 90 years of age. Hey, that's an age group that we can relate to. We're either at that age or getting close to it. And that means this therapy that works so well on mice could very well be applicable to people. 75 to 90 year old people who remove their senescent cells. Now, the experts are very consistent in what they tell us. They're doing these studies, they're watching aging go in reverse in their animal model studies, and they tell us to wait. They tell us to wait till more data comes in before we self-experiment with these senolytic approaches. Well, you may know me pretty well, I don't wait. We move technology ahead and we did a clinical trial on a group of people with severe bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis. We chose that category of study subject because it was working very well in the animal models and we could very quickly see are these people getting better with their arthritis. And the incredible news is about 90% had relief of pain, improved joint mobility, and it lasted about six months and then there was some more senescent cell accumulation and they want to repeat it. We did baseline MRIs of their joints to look at their cartilage and in December, we're gonna have the follow-up. We're gonna know, did those synolytics enable cartilage regeneration to occur? Symptomatically, it looks like it did, but again, we did the baseline and we're gonna do the follow-up to make sure that we're really seeing a result. This is the second time in history, I've shown this particular chart. The first time was at RADFest a couple weeks ago. This is the synolytic dosing protocol that we used in a clinical trial. And it's based on your weight. Dacitinab is a chemotherapy drug. That might frighten a lot of people away from using it. I'm gonna explain why it shouldn't in the next couple of slides. But you have to dose it very carefully. And if a physician compounds this for you, we think you'll be able to buy it at a reasonable price from a compounding pharmacy. The price uh, that it sells for to cancer patients is outrageous. So this is a synolytic dose schedule, second time in history it's ever been displayed in public, and it represents what's already been tested in a proof of concept study with about 11 people. So how do you get this drug? Well, if your doctor prescribes it, you can pay over $2,000 for what would be a, a two-week supply. That's two doses over a one-year uh, situation. But if we get some cooperation from the compounding pharmacies that we're working with, we think you can get that for around $200. Uh, the drug itself is not that expensive as a raw material. It's just once it achieves that FDA-approved status and gets a brand name and they sell it to cancer patients, they overcharge. So we're hoping to have compounding pharmacies very soon make dacitinab available for around $200. And that would be basically a one time a year treatment most of you would do. If you had osteoarthritis, you might do it two times a year. And this would be a very inexpensive therapy. And if you wonder how does removing senescent cells from your joints alleviate or eliminate arthritis? How does that happen? Well, think about this. You've got these senescent cells in your joints that are emitting pro-inflammatory factors and possibly worse than that, emitting, secreting these protein degrading enzymes. So your joint cartilage is being destroyed by the accumulated burden of senescent cells. So you take the dacitin abcoercitin, you kill off the senescent cells, macrophages clear them out, and then the inflammation and the protein degradation, well that abates. And then our chondrocytes can restore joint cartilage. And if you want to take it a step further, which is part of our protocol, by the way, of reversing aging systemically, you could add NAD therapy. Because we've seen in clinical trials that we've done on NAD infusion that osteoarthritis seems to mitigate. We're seeing that consistently occur. And the reason that it does that is, well, sirtuin-6 is necessary for the chondrocytes to replenish, and resveratrol and NAD, they boost sirtuin-6. The senescent cells are removed with quercetin and dacitinab, and all of a sudden, you've got a, a horrific osteoarthritis problem that may dissipate or go away completely. We are advocating physician supervision. We're amalgamating a list of physicians who will prescribe these medications and oversee you over so you can do it safely. NAD, we've talked a lot about that in this church. The data keeps getting stronger, that this is 
a way to slow down, if not reverse aging. Time magazine covered it earlier this year. A uh, prestigious researcher talked about the fact that when it's given to older mice, they act younger, behave younger, and they live longer. This is spectacular. And what David Sinclair talked about is that NAD may be the closest uh, intervention we've gotten to a fountain of youth and if we don't have any NAD in our body we die it's that simple and the problem is as we grow older our NAD levels decrease now vascular aging major problem study done at Harvard showed that resveratrol and NAD replenishment wow reversal of vascular aging improved circulation throughout our body this is major American Heart Association just a couple months ago comes out with a report indicating that they want to see NAD therapy experimented on in people with congestive heart failure. This kills a lot of Americans. Eight million suffer from it. And when we got credentialed people like the American Heart Association, this is absolutely spectacular. They're looking to put money into using NAD to repair our broken DNA. And that's the primary mechanism by which NAD works, by the way. Every day, our cells sustain breaks to our DNA. And NAD comes in and repairs that. Well, as our NAD levels go down, there's nothing there to repair our DNA. We literally die of pathological aging or something else because of an NAD deficiency. Now, these uh, findings here relate to the decline in NAD levels that occur with aging. This is a lot of research that's been funded over the last two years, and it shows between 20 and 40, you're in good shape. You have a nice high level of NAD, and then between 40 and 60, it declines. But what happens after 60 is really scary. It can drop down to virtually one to eight nanograms per milliliter. And at that stage, you are set for virtually every degenerative disorder out there. And age is not the only factor. There's middle-aged people who we test their blood and we find they are very deficient in NAD because they have a chronic health problem or they consume, consume too much ethanol. Um, physical mental stress, that all pushes down your NAD levels. But these findings, by the way, some of them have been published recently, some of them have not yet been published. You're privileged to learn information that will be in a prestigious scientific journal soon. You're learning it right now. The fact is, if you're over the age of 40 to 50, you really need to restore your NAD. And this is how people are doing it. They're undergoing infusions of NAD and boosting it back up to what a young range was. And then they can keep going, keep the NAD high, simply by using a dietary supplement called nicotinamide riboside. Now, some people think, well, why don't I just take a lot of the nicotinamide riboside capsules? It doesn't work for older people to get you to that youthful range. It will boost your levels, meaning it's good for you, but it's not gonna get you from, let's say, eight nanograms per, per microliter up to 40. It's just not gonna do that. Uh, it, there's actually a, re a reverse feedback mechanism that unfortunately, if you take too much nicotinamide riboside, your NAD levels will go down. So our typical recommended dose is between 250 and 750 a day, and if that doesn't boost your NAD sufficiently, use an infusion or a patch that has to be prescribed by a doctor, and you have to go visit a doctor for this stuff. These are some of the inconveniences you may have to endure, but the benefits, well, they're huge. Now, we know what happens when NAD levels plummet. We're talking about systemic aging and eventual premature death. This is what happens. But what I'm going to show you next are findings from a study. It's going to be published very soon, but this is pre-publication information of what happens when a group of older people, average age 79, in a poor state of health, these are typically metabolic syndrome patients, poor state of health, they underwent NAD infusions for about six to seven consecutive days. And these were the type of benefits that they were able to see in the clinic that these people were able to benefit from by boosting their NAD using infusion therapy. And we think the patches might work as well, and perhaps by next church service, I will let you know if the patches work as well, because if they do, they're gonna reduce your cost and make it a lot more convenient. The patches, of course, would enable NAD to absorb through your skin the way your topic, topical 
uh, hormones absorb through your skin and get into your bloodstream. But this data here is only the second time it's been shown in public. It will appear in a medical journal, and it may open the world's eyes to the fact that in addition to synolytics, you want to boost your NAD if you want to remain young and healthy. So this is a little bit outdated right now. We're not suggesting people get their blood levels tested necessarily. If you're over age 50, you probably need to do something to get those NAD levels up to where you need to be. And so we are suggesting that you undergo the infusion or patch therapy uh, with a licensed doctor, of course, and then stay on, get on the nicotinamide riboside for three to four weeks, and then test your blood to see where you are, to see if your NAD levels are where they should to be. What I emphasized everywhere I talk is the fact that a lot of us don't recognize that we're running out of time. I put age 64 up there because that's what I'm going to be very soon. That means I only have 20 years left. I've only got 20 years left to figure out this problem of biological aging and the degenerative diseases associated with it. And a lot of us have less time. So I'm advocating everywhere I go for accelerated age reversal research. Whatever we can do to accelerate the technology, we will live longer. And yes, the billionaires are putting big money into the research. Jeff Bezos is 54 years of age. He puts a billion dollars a year, by the way, into space exploration. He's put less money into age reversal research. We applaud the billionaires for putting big money into age reversal research. They're virtually all doing it, by the way. All these Silicon Valley people who did the impossible with IT technology, they're looking at aging as just another problem to solve. And the problem is they don't don't have the sense of urgency that we do in this church. They are going to take their time with it because they figure they've got the time. We don't, and I don't feel that I have the time. So we want to accelerate all of this research. We want to put all of the different age reversal interventions that you've heard about, talked about at this church since November 2013. That's the first service we had where we talked a lot about metformin and how important it was for you to take that prescription drug to slow your rate of aging. Well, that's pretty much accepted now. And what we want to do now is experiment with a number of other therapies and get a sequential order together so that no one has to needlessly suffer these types of consequences. And we do have people, by the way, contacting us saying, you know what, I, my mother now needs your services. And they're, they've had like a massive stroke or they've got sepsis. They've got like a couple days to live with the sepsis and maybe a couple miserable years to live with the, the paralysis from the stroke. And we have to tell them, no, it's kind of too late for that. Uh, you know, I mean, some people try it anyway, but we're not telling people in nursing homes to utilize these technologies. We're advocating you take advantage of them now before you wind up into a condition when we cannot save your life. Now, this is a church, so I guess talking about God is an, an appropriate situation, and the media is putting George Church up there in a deity-type status because if his CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology works as well as it does at the cellular level, it does reverse aging in cells, by the way, it's doing some nice things in animals. If this works in people, aging will become a relic of the past, the same way cholera is in societies that practice good hygiene and have access to antibiotics. Aging will be something that you'll tell your kids about, and they'll wonder whatever motivated you to do anything if you're just going to age to death. And George Church is not the only person using CRISPR technology to induce stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, to rejuvenate our tissues systemically. Uh, most of you understand how stem cells work. I'll briefly describe it. They produce somatic cells, which are the functional cells in our body. If we can turn our old functional cells back into induced pluripotent stem cells, that may be another way to achieve an indefinitely extended biological healthy lifespan. And scientists around the world are engaged in it. There is no upper longevity limit as to how long people can live. This study was published in Nature last year. A group of people got together and said, is there a way, reason why people can't live forever? And they said, well, not re really. There's nothing that stands in the way. Just a matter of advancing the technology. And again, Popular Science did a very nice article about me, the church, and all these scientists who are trying to make us live longer. And they singled me out because I'm a little bit different. I'm trying to get us to live indefinitely. 
forever. And the technology is moving in our favor. We just need to put the pieces together, and people are going to live a lot longer, a lot healthier, and they may not die. So again, this stair-step approach, which I presented at RADFest, we were suggesting rapamycin be initiated first, but it turned out that virtually everyone at RADFest had been on either metformin or calorie restriction, intermittent fasting. They were doing something to boost their AMPK, which then lowers excess mTOR. Most people, not in this group, by the way, but most people have too much mTOR, causes cancer, causes obesity, creates all kinds of problems. So this stair-step approach is utilizing the age reversal interventions in a rational way to get us to that year 2000, and if we, 2030, if we make it to 2030, that should enable us to reach the singularity when our neocortex merges with the cloud and we become immortal beings at our option. And I will take that option. I will say, yes, give me immortality. Uh, so again, media coverage with respected people talking about get to a year 2050. Make it to 2050 and you may live forever. And our dilemma is that very few of us will live that long if we don't aggressively intervene. So what this church expounds and, and tries to disseminate as widely as possible is that if people work together to solve a problem, it is much more likely to occur in our lifetime. Companies are being set up, by the way, to do the machine uploading to transmit our brain into the cloud so we truly will have that transhumanist view, a uh, 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 transhumanist uh, ability to not ever have to die. We set up uh, basically a new name. This, is, this used to be called the Society for the Rescue of Our Elders. It just wasn't catching on for some reason. So we changed the name to the Society for Age Reversal. It's a public benefit group. We don't accept donations. Uh, we don't get involved financially with anybody. What we simply do is try to track data. We encourage people to get their blood tested, send their blood tests to a new portal we'll soon have set up on our website, and then we know where you are baseline. And if you tell us you underwent NAD or senolytics or metformin, rapamycin, or young plasma, we'll be able to then see your follow-up results and then tabulate this in a way that will be able to gain real-world access to what people are doing to slow down and reverse their aging process. Again, we don't have any conflicts of interest because we don't take money, we don't invest in companies, and by that virtue, we're able to disseminate accurate, unbiased information. That is the website, Rescue Elders. It is being improved every single day, so if you log on to it and you don't find exactly what you want, I'll log on to it in a week. You may find some very, very interesting information and opportunities. I set up a longevity fund to, to accelerate research, and we've only got $650,000 in the account right now. It's an escrow account, by the way. It's not spent until we have a project, a big project to fund. And I've got $225,000 of new commitments, which only brings us up to $875,000. That's not enough to do the major research that we want to undertake. Uh, I'm personally funding all of this research out of my own pocket, as there are a few other philanthropists, uh, but the big projects, we need big money. And w within the next three to four weeks, if we don't get at least, well, several million or more dollars, we're going to refund all of the money in the Longevity Partnership Fund. Um, this is a chart showing our history of trying to raise money. Uh, the uh, Age Reversal Therapeutics Company, we were trying to raise $25 million back in 2016. Had we raised that money, we'd be much further ahead. Uh, we only raised 410000 We refunded 100% of the money. And right now, we've got the 650000 in the account. It's in an escrow account. It cannot be spent. And if we don't raise $10 million, frankly, it's all going back to the people who uh, invested uh, in it. Uh, if we take money for a purpose, we use the money for that purpose. We don't use it for anything else. What has happened in the last two years is some philanthropic donors have stepped forward and said, you, you only need $100,000 and you can do a clinical trial. They just write the checks. And I'm doing the same thing. If I can fund something for less than $100,000, I'll pay for it myself. I mean, a, a way to live an extra three to five years, if not indefinitely, I'm not going to let that kind of money stand in the way. So uh, we're looking for people who have 
the net worth to put in the big money so we can accelerate all this technology even further. And for those who just like to write checks to a charity, this is a brand new charity we set up. Um, it only funds human age reversal research. It does absolutely nothing else. So if people are looking for a tax deduction, they can write a check, any amount to this charity. It will only be used, again, for the purposes that I've stated, human age reversal research. No more animal uh, laboratory work from my money or, or this charity's money. It's got to be aging people. We've got 5,000 people who die every day in this country. We've got a lot of people that we can work with. So again, this is the website for people who want to stay informed about the availability of senolytics, availability of doctors who are prescribing NAD, uh, the availability of rapamycin at a reasonable price, uh, metformin, uh, young plasma, this is all going to be talked about on the Rescue Elders site. It already has a lot of data. Uh, but what we do is if you register and we have your email address, we will update you. We'll say, hey, there's a new doctor in your area who is doing NAD infusions or hopefully being able to prescribe NAD patches. will cost a lot less money and be less uh, inconvenient. So that pretty much wraps up my talk. And I'll be happy to answer any questions from the crowd. Thank you, Bill. What a great presentation. Who, are there any questions for Bill? Over here first. Peter? Yes. Uh, metform, is this supposed to hurt your kidneys also? If you're a type 2 diabetic or you have kidney failure, if your creatinine is over 1.5, they're advising against it, but they may let you go up to 2 as far as creatinine. Uh, the most reliable blood test to assess kidney function is cystatin C. So if you have a, a renal issue, um, get a cystatin C test done. That'll tell you the degree of renal impairment that you may be suffering from. So you are correct partially that if you have impaired kidney function, metformin is not something you should take. The idea is to get on metformin before that event occurs if you're able to. Great. Question back here, Doug. What do you think about GDF-11? Uh, we're fascinated by the prospect of GDF-11. Now, that's a protein present in young plasma, and as we grow older, it declines. There is a company uh, that's raised quite a bit of money to get GDF-11 approved as a treatment for congestive heart failure. And there is incredible data showing that people with heart failure, their GDF-11 levels are outrageously low. So there's strong data to indicate that GDF-11 could be a treatment for con congestive heart failure and may be able to reverse aging systemically. An individual named Steve Perry up in New York, he's got a little private association of people who are using GDF-11. They're reporting spectacular results, including potential stem cell regeneration. So we like it a lot. But people who are undergoing the young plasma infusions are getting GDF-11 automatically. So uh, it may be that the young plasma will take the place of the GDF-11. There's a question from Dennis. How do you get metformin and rapamycin if you don't have blood sugar problems or been diagnosed with diabetes? Or? Well, more and more doctors are prescribing metformin for its anti-aging purposes, its anti-cancer purposes. A few oncologists are rec recognizing that cancer patients can benefit by taking metformin along with conventional therapy. Um, so it's a matter of we're going to have a listing of doctors at the Rescue Elders site who will prescribe it. We've got some doctors listed now, but we plan or hope to expand that dramatically because it's been proven now, uh, my group, uh, rec recommended metformin back in 1995. We came under a lot of criticism for it, but now that it's been 22 years, um, people understand you can safely take it. I've been taking metformin since around 2000. I take a rather high dose, and I've had no problems. But there are people, however, who have a digestive issue, maybe 20%. They just can't tolerate it. It causes diarrhea for them. And those people may want to take rapamycin, which works in a similar way as metformin does to suppress excess mTOR. A question from Kenny. Uh, over the years, I've been fascinated by this entire subject, but figured, you know, the technology wasn't far enough yet to really get it involved. Let's say you found that money was not an object for you know, a group that was willing to put in whatever it took 
what would you do with that at this point? Would we be able to utilize that money now on you, something specific? That we, would we, we, would, we would launch a true Manhattan project to find a cure for aging, to save as many human lives as possible. There are a number of physician scientists who have probable mechanisms in place that they feel can meaningfully reverse systemic aging. But these are expensive therapies. They do require $5 million, $10 million. But if money was of no object, we would probably simultaneously conduct 20 to 30 clinical trials on people of different age groups and carefully measure what works, what doesn't. And I think we could cure aging in about the same time it took for them to develop the atom bomb. Money is the, the issue. It, it, it holds back a lot of important research. Yes, dedicated solely to making old people grow biologically younger. That's the objective. Question from Carol. Yes. Could you explain how stem cell therapy works with osteoarthritis knees? I'm hearing more and more about that. We all, there are certain doctors who are injecting right into the joint stem cells to regenerate the cartilage. And we have anecdotally heard of spectacular results. We've also anecdotally heard of, of results that just aren't working. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the individual practitioner as to how skilled he is. And we think that those senescent cells may be a factor as to why more people don't benefit from localized stem cell therapy into their joints. And if, if these doctors would start prescribing dacetinib and coercetin over a two-week period, it's only two doses, by the way, a dose on a Sunday and then a dose on a Sunday the next week, just those two doses of dacetinib coercetin get rid of the senescent cells in the lining of the joints and enable those stem cells then to repopulate and regenerate the cartilage. And then you add NAD to that, then you further enhance the potential of the stem cells administered localized to survive in your joint. I'd like to think that you'd have that regeneration occur there too. A question from Jeff. Yes, how would you compare the uh, NAD, the capsules that are now available, you know, the 100 and 250 milligram capsules to the infusion of NAD through the uh, intravenous? Okay, let me explain. They're uh, starting probably around 2014, 2015, a company called Elysium, uh, and they consist of a bunch of Harvard scientists. They started aggressively promoting uh, the virtues of nicotinamide riboside. That's a precursor to NAD in your body. And they were able to show that if you take this capsule, you can boost your NAD levels 40 to 90%. Now that might sound impressive, and if you're, let's say, 40 to 50 years of age, that may be all you need. But if you, I don't expect you to remember that chart I showed, but when older people's uh, blood is tested for NAD, it can be between one and eight. So if you boost something, let's say eight by 40% or even 90%, you still don't come close to that 40 number that you had when you were younger. So the the capsules work in everybody. They boost NAD in everybody, but when you get over a certain age, you need NAD itself to be infused or absorbed into your body and then maintain those doses, those levels, with the precursor. A question from Linda. So you're talking about senescent cells and quercetin and the other... Um, the dacetinab, yeah. I can't say it, whatever. The research was done on mice, rats, were they? And, and people. And people. Well, well th th there's a group that funded a study uh, on people with severe osteoarthritis and no side effects. Um, and, uh, well, well, I guess some people take something and they don't feel right that day. I, I've taken dacetinib and quercetin. I was expecting side effects. It was absolutely zero. But nonetheless, we've done a uh, proof of concept clinical trial on people and uh, their osteoarthritis, for the most part, was alleviated. There may be a patch, she's asking? A patch for NAD. Yes. As far as the synolytics, 
you need the dacetinib and the quercetin. Quercetin sold in health food stores, dirt cheap. Dacetinib, prescription drug, that's something we're hoping some compounding pharmacies will make available soon. So you can go to your doctor, he weighs you, and he prescribes the precise dose of dacetinib that you need. Oh, the course then you take with the dacetinab, and just take that once a week also about, again, depends on your weight, but probably around 1,400 milligrams. Well, quercetin alone is not going to do the job that you want it to. It's going to get rid of some senescent cells. But to do what you're seeing, to achieve the benefits that you've seen in these animal studies and in the human study, you need the quercetin and the dacetinab. They, they have synergistic mechanisms. So you, you really need to do both. Yes, there are doctors who are very interested in working with our groups to initiate these age reversal therapies. And we just want to make sure that they're totally on board before we refer people to them. We have a, we have a question from John over here. Let me, let me move over here. But uh, Linda, uh, I recommend perhaps you can talk with Bill uh, after the event. Here's John. Uh, to that gentleman's question, I think it was Doug, if I got that right now. Um, about the availability of metformin. My wife was just down in Juarez a couple of weeks ago, and it was, metformin was available over the counter for $2 a box. Uh, yeah, in Juarez, yeah, and in Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, yeah, so next time you're on a cruise or on near the border or whatever, and they don't really care how much you bring back over. So that one. Well, one. yeah, there are offshore sources for virtually everything I'm referring to, and it's just a matter of going on the internet and finding it. Um, if you have a prescription from a doctor, it's really easy. You can buy from Canada. There are, there are pharmacies around the world that ship to Americans, and there's very seldom a problem. So gaining access to this is relatively easy, but I'm just going to say you should work with a physician, ideally. But I know some of you are just going to self-experiment and do it on your own. Yeah, Bill, and what is the current cost outlay for rapamycin if you get it from a viable source? I'm yeah, sure. there, there, there's a pharmacy in England that's offering a 14-week supply for $90, and there's some okay. pharmacies in some other countries that maybe also be offering very low-cost rapamycin. So uh, the good news is drugs don't cost a whole lot to make. It's not like you have to take a bunch of green tea and condense it. They synthesize these drugs in a way that they uh, are very inexpensive if you buy them somewhere else than the United States. OK, we have a question from Jerry. Hi. I, I may have misunderstood. Did you say that ethanol knocks out the NADE? Yeah, unfortunately, excessive ethanol ingestion. Uh, Xylitol? No, not, not, not that I know of. We're talking about alcohol. We're talking about the beverages that people like to excessively ingest. And what happens is the NAD acts as a detoxifying agent. So you swallow a lot of alcohol, drink a lot of alcohol, and your NAD goes to your liver and detoxifies the alcohol and then depletes your body of that, vi that vital coenzyme. Someone was asking about the Rescue Our Elders or the Society for Reverse Aging, and we have flyers for those on the free tables, both upstairs and downstairs. So if you didn't get that website, please see me, or we'll get you that brochure so that you can get that information. There's a question over here. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> has there been any research on the psychological factors in life extension, and let's say keeping... Uh, multitudes of people alive that have minimal value, they haven't really taken care of themselves, they haven't developed themselves uh, psychologically or mentally or, you know, advanced themselves, but they're just living longer. So what is that going to affect? And what about inheritance in families and individuals? There's all these other psychological factors to consider. Well, the good news is the people who underwent the NAD infusions, uh, their depression was alleviated. They felt a lot of cognitive function was restored. Some of the other therapies that we've investigated, the young plasma, people feel younger. They feel younger. As it relates to people who have gone too far with degenerative aging, there may be a point where we can't do a thing about it right now. But um, th th there's a lot of answers to your questions, by the way, and I can't solve everyone's problem. My focus is on solving problems for people in this group. We want to live a long, healthy life, so we're going to take the bull by the horns and do it, and there'll be plenty of other people who just ignore it. Question from Robert. Hey, hi, Bill. Uh, say, uh, 
The, uh, from what I understand now, they have the uh, NAD patch, and they may even be coming out with a uh, nasal uh, spray. How does that stack up to the IV? Do you have any information on that? We've done a clinical trial with NAD patches, and we simply are waiting for the blood test results to come back. And when they come back, that will be posted on the Rescue Elder site. So we hope the patches work as well as the infusions. We've got some preliminary data that they might be working from the standpoint of people feeling better, more energetic, sleeping better. So, so we're hoping these patches work to cut down on the cost. The nasal spray, we don't know yet. Question over here from Val. Uh, I understand that uh, tinnitus is something that increases and increases as we get older. And I've been told that there is no cure for tinnitus. What's your answer to that? Well, I suffered a loud noise event about five years ago. Um, and uh, I didn't realize all it takes is one exposure to a loud noise, and that can leave you with tinnitus forever. Um, high doses of R lipoic acid and coenzyme Q10. And just uh, wearing earplugs now wherever I go where there's loud noise. Um, over the last four or five years, it's kind of gone away. Now, I'm not saying that's going to work for everybody, but avoiding exposure to loud noise. I, I keep the earplugs in my car so in case I'm accidentally exposed to it. And, you know, you all may be going to like weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever, where they seem to need to crank music up so loud. And I think a lot of you just sit through it not realizing you're destroying your ears in a way that you're going to live with tinnitus and, and, and loss of hearing. So uh, earplugs, highly, highly recommended. I, I've not gone anywhere without them since that event, and I was able to reverse it in myself. Thank you, Bill. Here's a question from Keith. Bill, wouldn't it be nice if Big Pharma would sort of like come across with some money for the well-being of people other than pills, opioids, and that? Well, the good news is there is uh, a number of, uh, of projects going on. Let me restate that. Big Pharma recognizes that suppressing mTOR is going to extend people's lifespan. We're doing it in this room with metformin, with calorie restriction, and some of us rapamycin. They can't make money off that. So what they've done is patented mTOR C1 inhibiting compounds. And Big Pharma is putting money into seeing if those compounds will not enable people to live longer or eradicate certain diseases. So there is some money being put in by Big Pharma. They're just not doing it with anything we're talking about here because it's not patentable. Question for Mike. Mr. Falloon, you look great. Thank you. Question. Your viewpoints on low-dose naltrexone and cannabinoids. Okay, I've heard some great anecdotal feedback on low-dose naltrexone. Not tried it myself. Concern is it might interfere with my sleep in the beginning. Um, but I, if, if it wasn't for sleep issues, I probably would try it. Tremendous data. Uh, cannabinoids, bad news on that. And it's really disappointing. Um, and that is the immune-suppressing effects of THC. And you can imagine uh, your NK cells which are your primary line of defense against malignancies and viruses, bacteria, they have receptor sites. And when there is an invader in your body, interleukin-2 binds to that receptor site. THC also binds to that NK receptor site, blocking the ability of IL-2 to activate it. So people who are overdoing cannabinoids are suppressing their immune function. Yeah, if it's no THC, you're probably okay. But it's, it's the THC that's creating the immune suppressant problems. And that's great, by the way, if you have an autoimmune disorder. You want to turn down your immune system. But most of us are suffering immune senescence, and we have diminished NK activity percentage as it is, so the cannabinoids can work against us. Question. Well, we have a question from Judy back here. Where would I find information about the calorie restriction program that you suggest would it be on the website we'll probably have something about intermittent fasting on our rescue elders website but it's becoming so popular that if you just go onto google and type intermittent fasting you're going to spend all night long reading blogs and articles 
get, get referred to books. It's becoming very prevalent, again, in the Northern California area, and it's spreading throughout the country. It turns out that when you undereat, yeah, you have to get, it takes a couple days to get used to it, but you feel better. You feel more energetic. So people are intentionally reducing their calorie intake to not only live longer in the future, but to feel better today. A question from Samantha. Um, what have you found to be the optimal diet for life extension? We advocate for the general public a Mediterranean type diet. But to be more aggressive than that would involve the intermediate uh, fasting, intermittent fasting, where uh, what I do, by the way, is if I wake up at, let's say, one in the afternoon, I will not eat until maybe nine o'clock that night. And since I slept, I may go 15 to 18 hours, many days, with, without consuming any calories. This boosts AMPK, it suppresses mTOR, and it improves bone marrow function. It allows our body essentially to recuperate. What people are doing today is they're eating breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and then more snacks before they go to bed. Their body never gets a chance to regenerate itself. All it's doing is metabolizing excess calories. So the less you eat, or if you can just break it up to give your body a break. Some people are fasting one or two days a week. Other people, again, are just doing it like I am. I'm fasting 15 to more 18 hours a day in some cases. And I feel great. I don't miss anything. I have a question back here, Bill. How many milligrams of metformin should you take if you're non-diabetic? What's the recommended dose? Well, it depends on how much your GI tract can tolerate. Uh, minimum dose to get a, a significant benefit should be about 500 milligrams twice a day. That's kind of a minimum dose. I had a talk with a brilliant uh, physician who's doing a lot of these clinical trials, and he was suggesting something that many people would be challenged to comply with, but he was suggesting taking 250 to 500 milligrams of metformin maybe four to five times a day to make sure it's in your body all the time. That's what he was suggesting, and we'll have to do a study on it. But uh, I'm personally taking all oh, between 875 milligrams and 2,700 milligrams, depending on how much I eat. If I undereat, which I do most days, I don't take as much metformin. I think I heard Ray Kurzweil say at the Radfest that he was taking every, every uh, four hours 500 milligrams? Uh, have to, have yeah, to... and he might be doing that. He is a type 2 diabetic, and he also is taking metformin to reduce his risk of cancer mm -hmm. and, and slow his rate of aging. But to keep the metformin levels high in your body, they do sell and extend release metformin. costs a lot more money, but that's another way of doing it. But to maintain higher metformin blood levels is probably going to do you a lot of good. It just depends on how many times a day you can remember to take the pill. I have a question here from Kathy. Yes, um, since you're talking about calorie intake and intermittent fasting, um, my mind goes to how do you feel about animal products versus plant-based foods? Do you well, have any you thoughts can, about that? If you can avoid animal products, you're doing yourself a huge favor. People who live on plant-based diets, they live about seven years longer, and their risk of cancer and vascular disease is reduced. So uh, more and more people are getting away, especially from the red meats, and, and, and trying to add vegetables and reduce the protein. And you're, gonna, you're just going to do better. I mean, that's been validated for many, many decades. Question from Lawrence. You said that you fast between 15 to 18 hours a day. Most days, not every day. How do you break your fast? What do you eat to break your fast? Uh, something very minimal. I may only eat seven or eight hundred calories. I may have some steamed tofu brought in with, with the Chinese vegetables, uh, uh, a salad, something like that. I don't feel a, a need to stuff a lot of calories into me just because I fasted for 15 to 18 hours. I'm not that hungry, but I realize, hey, it's getting late. I better eat something. So, I mean, you, you can't overdo this, you understand. And, and I, I do caution people who take a lot of metformin and then they do aggressive calorie restriction. They, they may be overdoing it. So, so uh, I, I try to achieve some balance. Question from John. Make it quick, Bill. Um, I, also, I also intermittently fast to the tune of about 15 to 18 a day, and I take metformin. Do you take metformin during the fasting period, or do you wait until you, you eat towards the end of the day? Like I've been, I don't know if I want to take it on an empty stomach as to upset my stomach or if it'd be contraindicated. Now, for me personally, I can take 875 milligrams of metformin on an empty stomach, 
and I don't have any problems. Other people would have massive diarrhea. So it really depends on how your body deals with it. But the metformin really helps curb my appetite. It's one of the side benefits of metformin. A lot of people don't realize that if you get on this, for the most part, you're just not as hungry. So I can easily take metformin, drink some black coffee, and I'm fine. I, I don't even think about it. I literally have to say, it's getting late. I better eat something. So uh, I think you could do both. Take a metformin uh, in the morning, and then when you have your first meal, take another one. We have a couple more questions left. Here's one from Jerry. Uh, <clears throat> if you're taking a lot of supplements, which I do, uh, sometimes I worry about interaction between supplements that might knock out my kidneys or my liver or something like that. Uh, is, is that something I should be concerned about with supplements? Not that we know of. We've been doing this for 40 plus years, we have a lot of people who have been taking a lot of supplements. We haven't seen any type of epidemic of chronic kidney failure. Um, the amount of supplements you're taking, it seems large, but if you're cutting down on your protein intake, especially if you're avoiding red meat, et cetera, you're sparing your kidneys a lot of work. So even though your kidneys yeah, are going to process the metformin and the supplements, if you're eating healthy, you really should not worry about that. Okay, Suji. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Everybody. Um, I don't feel bad now. I wake up and I don't eat until I'm hungry. And some days I forget to eat altogether. It's like without a plan. And I think that it's just my, my higher intelligence just kind of knowing how to spread it out, I guess. But I want to ask about the B vitamins and the nerves, the nerve sheaths, the nerve conductivity, and nerve pain. Well, if you're going to maintain healthy neurological function, you need certain nutrients. And if you're going to aggressively calorie restrict, I suppose supplementation becomes that more important. And further to the question about avoiding red meat, there are some healthy nutrients in red meat, uh, vitamin B12. So if you're a strict vegetarian or vegan, you really should take a, a B12 supplement. And red meat also contains carnosine. That's a dipeptide, very good for you. Red meat is one of the few sources you're going to get it. So if you cut out red meat, take 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams a day of carnosine and not let that nutrient be totally deficient. We think we've identified some reasons why vegetarians don't live longer, more longer than, than people who eat meat, and that is that sometimes they're deficient. Yeah, carnosine, C-A-R-N-O-S-I-N-E, carnosine. And uh, it used to be really expensive, and the price has dropped dramatically over the last 18 years. Well, if you're going to, like, not eat all day, I think you should try to take at least a multivitamin. In other words, make sure you don't deplete the nutrients. As Roy Walford uh, quoted many, many times, he was a pioneer of calorie restriction. You know, you, you want to have undernutrition without malnutrition. So you, you don't want to undereat so much that you injure yourself. Question from Michael. Hi, Bill. I don't take any medicine. You think I should stop? Depends on what your blood test results reveal. It, it really, I have no idea looking at you if you need any medication or a lot of medication. Uh, you get a comprehensive blood test, uh, doctors, if they prescribe it for you, it, Well, then you, may not, then you may not need anything. However, aging is taking a toll. No matter what we do, and there's some people who have lived very healthy lives, at some point, they run out of time. So you might want to consider metformin as a way to slow down your rate of aging. And you may want to consider replenishing your NAD levels because they're not where they were when you were 20. I wish I could say some people were exceptions. We haven't found any exceptions. If you're over 60, your levels are low. At, at, at age 80, they get down to one. They get down so low that you're barely able to repair your DNA. And 80 happens to be the time when most people die on average. And that's a point where their NAD levels collapse. So metformin and NAD, something to consider. Of course, the senescent cell removal. We really only have time for a couple more questions. Here's one from Judith. Hi, I'm very interested since you mentioned metformin because my doctor has me on 500 milligrams of metformin four times, four tabs, two in the morning, two at night. I don't find any side effects, but being diabetic, I am concerned that I go too long without eating and that I'm afraid that 
that's going to lower my blood sugar, so I have to make sure that I'm eating enough. So I don't. Well, I don't if you're understand. testing your blood glucose yourself, you can really make those kind of decisions. And if it drops too low, bear in mind, healthy, optimal glucose would be between 60 and 70 milligrams per deciliter. And um, if you can keep it, what, what is your typical glucose? It's been like 180, and it shouldn't be above 150. It should be between 90 and 150. My, my. Well, I, I wouldn't worry about under eating or metformin when glucose is that high. So I think you should consider increasing your dose of metformin under your doctor's supervision, looking at other medications, and uh, looking at a very radical diet that eliminates starches and sugars. You know, re really. Try to get those glucose levels down to around the, at least 100 level. Good. Question from Dave. Bill, thank you. Terrific program. Um, I'm weaning myself off of a statin drug, and I'm going to take niacin, life extension niacin. And I understand that could be very, very helpful. I have had a heart attack nine years ago. I passed the stress test uh, very easily, and I'm 70. Uh, am I doing the right thing? You know, niacin was very popular in the early 1980s because it not only lowers LDL, it boosts HDL. And we had hoped that would be a good alternative to statins. But two major problems, and many of you have probably experienced it, the niacin flush where your, your skin becomes very red, it feels like you're having a, an acute allergic reaction, uh, you get a burning effect, and some people, it, it doesn't bother them, that's probably 5%, but the rest of us, it really is troublesome, that side effect. But also, some studies, unfortunately, did not reveal the heart attack risk reduction expectation that people taking high-dose niacin were supposed to have. Their HDL went up, their LDL went down, but they were still having too many heart attacks. So I would recommend you stay on the statin and not go on the niacin at this point. A lot of people hate when I recommend statins, but if you do a statin every other day, you can get the identical protective benefit and avoid most of the side effects. So consider every other day statin use. A question from Don. Two quick questions, Bill. Uh, you talk about fasting. Like, how often should you fast? Like, every month? And the other question is, nutritionists say that you should eat small meals, like four to six small meals a day. I just want to see how you what you say about that. Yeah, it used to be thought that four to six small meals a day would spare your body the stress of having to metabolize all that food. But the, the newer way of thinking is uh, you can do two day a week fasting and it doesn't have to be 100% fasting. Some people are consuming five to 700 calories during those two days of so-called fasting. Uh, it enables them to get through it a little bit easier. So the two days a week is becoming very popular, but even more easy to comply with as far as I and a lot of other people are concerned is if you can just get 12 hours of the day, ideally a little bit more, maybe 15, where you are not eating, that cleanses your body of a lot of toxins and it reduces a lot of the burden. So, Well, you know, some recent studies are showing it's not what people thought it was. The problem is people were eating all day long and eating at night. Uh, so if you just if you fast all day long, you can eat at night. And um, but, but again, if you overdo anything, it's, it's it's bad. But newer data again is showing people can eat really a lot of calories after they break that 15-hour fast and derive tremendous benefit. Question from Andrew. Uh, what are some quick ways, if you want your, your pet, your dog, to live a couple extra years, what's the, what would you do uh, cheaply or, or first things you would do? Well, I would do everything that we've talked about, but something that could work out really interestingly would be the rapamycin. I've shown a CNN video clip at this church several times of, uh, and this was done, uh, made in 2016, where um, a woman had an old dog and she put it on rapamycin and it grew young. I mean, it was running around the yard like a puppy. And that ignited a project in San Francisco called the Young Dog Project. And they gave, they gave rapamycin to a group of old dogs, and they had significant improvements in their cardiac function. 
and, and dogs often die of heart failure. Um, and there's that, that study now has been expanded via the, the Young Dog Project. So if you want to keep your dog around and experiment with your dog before yourself maybe, uh, rapamycin based on the dog's weight. Uh, people who weigh, let's say, an average of 150 pounds are taking about 5 milligrams a week of rapamycin. So look at your dog's weight. If it's 75 pounds, maybe give it 2.5 milligrams a week of rapamycin. And if it tolerates it, maybe bump the dose up and let us know how it works. Question from Jerry. Yes, uh, my son is a physiatrist and uh, he's done a real good bunch of research and he finds life extension is great because it always has what it says in every one of its supplements. I know I'm giving you a good deal on that. Also, I think I got those special earplugs that I, at one time you guys were selling, the Hurons, which block out decibels above conversation levels. We use that in karaoke's. We can hear our people at our table. It blocks out the higher decibels that are destructive. A question on enzymatic garlic. And my son did some studies and said the research has shown that it's as good as statins, low-dose statins. I was on low-dose statins and I got the muscular problems with it and almost had a paralyzed arm from it. And I went on enzymatic garlic and I found, and he's, as he's found, that not only lowers your cholesterol and your triglycerides and raises your HDL, but it lowers your systolic blood pressure on the average of eight millimeters and three for the diastolic. Yeah, everything and it's you're worked for me. It's kept uh, my cholesterol real good. Everything you said is Correct, but let me qualify that. It's very important to qualify. The amount of blood pressure lowering and cholesterol lowering that can be accomplished with garlic is often insufficient for most people. I say most people, let's say your LDL is 160. Well, the garlic might drop it down to 140. It needs to be way below 100. Uh, that, that's the issue. And with blood pressure, too, a lot of people, their systolic blood pressure is 160, so the garlic drops it down to 150. It needs to be below 120. So the garlic absolutely works, but for most people, they need more than the garlic. So we do advocate for a blood pressure medication called Telmisartan. And if your LDL is persistently high, the every other day use of a statin drug can sometimes, or maybe even doing it twice a week, could move you down into a good range. It sounds like you've had a great benefit with garlic. Uh, some studies have come out showing that garlic can reverse atherosclerosis, and it's doing it by mechanisms different than blood pressure reduction and cholesterol reduction. So we know there's huge benefits to aged garlic extract, the Kyolic aged garlic extract, validated in one study after another to reverse atherosclerosis, really good for you to take. But again, if your cholesterol and blood pressure is real high, it's not going to lower it enough. And those earplugs you talked about, to get them, typically you go to a music store. They sell the really good quality earplugs that just, just cut down on the loud noise. And you can still hear everything, but they cut down on a very high decibels. And they cost about $15 in a music store. They sell earplugs like at Walmart and Walgreens, and they don't work that well. From Linda, one question. Thanks, Bill. This was a wonderful, informative lecture, seminar. Really enjoyed it. Uh, the last question is, you never mentioned exercise. And doesn't exercise actually help you to, I mean, it has so many benefits to yeah, it. Yeah, exercise also, reduces your risk of cancer by boosting the cellular enzyme AMPK. So exercise... I would assume everyone here understands is great for you. Uh, and, and the problem is people have different tolerance levels. Some people do a lot, some people do a little. But the mechanism, because I've read studies dating back 20, 30 years, people who exercise have low cancer rates. And I couldn't correlate them until I realized the exercise boosts AMPK, just like metformin does, just like calorie restriction does. And that increase in AMPK turns down mTOR and turns down your risk of cancer. So um, yeah, exercise is fantastic. And anti-aging, when you boost AMPK, you slow aging. Last question tonight is from Richard. I was wondering, uh, as far as antioxidants go, can you overdose on those, like astaxanthin and things like that? Can they have a negative effect? 
I don't have any data that would show that you can overdose on them. The studies that they do with antioxidants typically are low dose, and then when they don't work, they say antioxidants are ineffective. So um, we, we don't have any data on, on the high dose people. Uh, we do know that low dose antioxidants are not sufficient to improve healthy longevity. Okay, la ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Falloon. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the presentation you saw tonight was full of information. I can imagine that you were taking notes or perhaps weren't, but we will have the YouTube available, so you'll be able to watch this presentation on YouTube in about an hour, immediately after it's processed. So know that you can go to our website, go to the YouTube channel, and, and watch this again. Also, a, 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 a different version of the PowerPoint, but a similar version, will be available on our website as well in the next couple of days. So you'll be able to see much of that information. Uh, at the RADFest, Bill came up with the Age Reversal Update, this booklet. I have a few of these. What I'd like to do is uh, maybe what we could do is scan this in and, and make this available to our members. Okay, it's already being amended, so we'll get an amended version sometime in the near future, we hope. On the Rescue Elder site. So you can go to the Rescue Elder site. Again, to go to the Rescue Elder site, if you don't have the, uh, you can Google that, Rescue Elders, or you can get the brochure that's on the back table or the free table downstairs. Right. All right. So I'd like to uh, note that next November is our five year anniversary here. Five year anniversary, in November. It's great. We have Bill Falloon again speaking next November, November the 8th. Doors open at 6, presentation at 7. Kelsey Moody's coming from i Therapeutics, and we're looking forward to that. We do have a, a delicious dinner ready for you downstairs, uh, your choice of fish or chicken or a vegan option. Uh, very happy to accept your donation. If you'd like to make a donation, there's a donation box in the back, and we're very thankful to have you here tonight. Look forward. Now, if you have any questions I'm about cryonics, if you're curious about that, Devere is here. Devere, say hello to everybody. Talk to Devere, talk to myself, talk to any of the others. We're happy to talk. Nick is here, can talk with you about that as well. So thanks for coming, and we'll see you next month.